The following program was paid for by the friends and partners of WLMB TV 40 Toledo. So after three years there, when they really trusted me, they started showing me how ADM did business and that involved a price fixing scheme. God led me to believe that, you know, no matter what we are gonna go through, he would be biased, God would be with us, but Mark needed to, to let the FBI know what was going on. Today we're going to be talking about redemption and second chances. Our guests are going to be sharing their almost unbelievable but completely incredible story of discovering God's grace. Please welcome Mark and Ginger Whitaker. Welcome. It's an honor to have you guys here. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So you have this amazing story. And so I kind of want to set it up a little bit. Um, so you were undercover you know, at your job wearing a wire for uh, three years working with the FBI, Mark, and uh, you, you're working for a Fortune 500 company and you're going to be a whistleblower, but then you ended up in prison for eight and a half, almost nine years in federal prison for fraud and tax evasion. And um, well, you know, to many people, this would sound like a movie. And as you guys well know, well, it became a movie. Your, uh, your story was the inspiration for a major motion picture, The Informant, uh, starring Matt Damon as you. Yeah, my twin, my identical <laughs> twin. Obviously, your twin, yes. <laughs> well, you know, um, God has truly used your story, though, to reach many, many people. Um, but there was a time where God was not a part of your life. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what life was like before God. Uh, well, for me, personally, I, I went to Cornell University and an Ivy League school and got a PhD in biochemistry and I was 22 years old as a PhD student and the average age is about 32 and right. I graduated at age 25 with my PhD and all I all I could think about was using this Ivy League PhD to to move up the corporate ladder and become a CEO of one of the largest companies of the world and at age 32 I became a divisional president of the biotech division of the 56th largest company on the Fortune 500 known as ADM they're the 41st largest company in America today and I became number four executive out of 30,000 employees and I, I didn't know God it was this was uh, this is an example of selfish leadership not servant leadership and I lived in a mansion with an eight-car garage. We had horse riding stables where our kids could ride inside in an in arena during the winter time. And, and I filled that eight-car garage with eight cars at a Ferrari, two BMWs, two Mercedes. And like I said, look out, Bon Jovi. Look out. Here I come. <laughs> so, Ginger, what was your perception of life at that time? It was, for me, a, a little bit crazy. For him, it was all the things that drew him to uh, find that that was joyful. I did enjoy his income, obviously, because I was using it in different ways, helping uh, the church, helping my family, helping things, doing local things in the community. Um, so I have to say, I did enjoy the income. I just didn't enjoy how it was being uh, used and, and derived. And, but I came to faith when I was 13. So I was a little bit on a different path than Mark was at that time. So I was seeing that this was a blessing that we could use this money um, really to help others. All right, so you're living this incredible life, um, you know, filled with everything that your heart could desire. Uh, well, Mark, how did you end up working undercover for the FBI then? Um, well, well, basically after being there for three years, the vice chairman, because they were, the CEO was 75 years old, the president was 69 years old, and I was 32. So they knew they were gonna be retiring and moving on at some point, so they wanted to bring, uh, help groom and help mentor uh, younger guys to take their place. So after three years there, when they really trusted me, they started showing me how ADM did business, and that involved a price-fixing scheme, an international cartel, where we got together with our competitors, which is illegal, breaking antitrust laws, and we were fixing the prices of ingredients that that go into the, all your viewers, their groceries. It'd be difficult to buy a grocery, a Kellogg cereal, a Pepsi, an orange juice, a Pillsbury or Kraft. ADM's ingredients are in all those foods, and we were fixing the prices of those ingredients, which was inflating the prices of groceries. So, okay, so then you're, you're ready to bust them. You're gonna go in as an informant, and you're gonna get wired up every day. So what was life like as an informant? Well, basically, I was on this. Uh, well, I was willing to do anything to keep moving up the corporate <laughs> ladder. And then when I shared with Ginger, the very day that I shared with Ginger, 
about the price fixing scheme and what was going on. And I'll never forget. She said, you mean my grandma on $250 a week? Social Security is paying extra for her groceries. And we live in a 13,000 square foot mansion with an eight car garage and flying around on a corporate jet. She said, boy, I don't, I don't know if I can live with this. This is stealing. Mm-hmm. And when she really understood it and, and understood that it was stealing from every consumer uh, around the world, she forced me to, to turn myself into the FBI. So, a case that was going on for 12 years. <laughs> so, what, you know, so what was that conversation like? Well, basically what he said, when it came down to you're stealing from my family, my grandparents, my sister, my brother, you know, how could I sit, ac- sit across the table from them at a holiday or any meal, I know that you know we're living in this grand house and all these cars, but yet it was from money that was stolen from them and from everybody around the world, my neighbors, um, you know, everyone. And so it really became an is- a real black and white issue for me. It was stealing, simple right. as that. It, they could call it a cartel, they can call whatever they want. They're stealing, and that's just not something that was allowed in our home. That was we were taught that's you know just not right. It's not what God would want. And so I told him I would go up and pray about it, like like what we needed to do, like how we were going to deal with this. And God led me to believe that, you know, no matter what we are going to go through, he would be biased. God would be with us. But Mark needed to to let the FBI know what was going on. He says, turn him in. I say, let them know what's going on. So So then you you become an informant and you spend three years of your life wired up. You know, how did this impact you? Well, first off, when they started, uh, when I started wearing a wire after I confessed for four hours to the FBI and Ginger by my side, it was a billion dollar theft a year, a billion, not a million, but a billion dollar theft a year for well over a decade that was ongoing. And I was involved seven months at that point. And that's when Ginger and I started having that conversation because she could tell something changed those last Mm -hmm. seven months. And so she was asking me what's going on in my life and where I shared that with her. And then I had uh, had a choice when we shared the FBI, you you either go to jail that day Mm -hmm. or you start wearing a wire tomorrow. And that's how I became uh, an FBI informant. I'd meet the FBI agents at six o'clock in the morning. They'd shave my chest, hook a microphone to my chest. I had a tape recorder and briefcase, one in a notebook, one on my back with an athletic band. And I take my coworkers, supervisors, and friends eight, nine, ten hours a day every day for three years. Okay, so we know that eventually you ended up in jail. So how did things go wrong? I mean, like so far you sound like a hero. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically they gave me full immunity. When the FBI agents would wire me up, they'd say, Mark, if these guys catch you, they're going to kill you. This is serious stuff. So they were so appreciative for me to risk my life and wear a wire against this large international cartel that involved companies from around the world, that they gave me full immunity, never to be charged, never go to jail. And after a couple years of wearing a wire, I started thinking, I'm going to, what's going to happen here? Mm -hmm. And there was announcements that I would be the next president of the company, not a divisional president, but to move up to company president. And then Ginger started convincing me. She said, you you don't think you're going to still be working there, do you? There's no way they're all going to go to jail and you're going to go to work like nothing happened, especially with the CEO that the board had his son, his daughter, his nephew, his brother. So at this point, you're thinking he's lost his mind. Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And I was. The longer I wore a wire, I literally was. I was blowing the driveway off during thunderstorms at three in the morning with gas leak blowers. I mean, I was losing it and had to meet the FBI at six every morning for those three years. And I started thinking about, well, what's going to happen when I, you know, I, I, seven years of that lifestyle, that mansion, the corporate jet, the cars, I couldn't imagine life without it. And so I started thinking, are they going to give me a golden parachute when they fire me like most executives? <laughs> well, I'm going to be a witness against them in a federal case. They're probably not. So and then I had these stock options that were actually going to be exercised at a certain time that was going to gain millions of dollars. But I was going to be fired before I could exercise those. So I made the decision on my own thinking, boy, I went to Cornell. I'm the smartest guy in this room. (laughs) And I made the decision on my own to write my own severance package. I basically exercised like those stock options early. I wrote my own severance. I stole my own severance package and wrote five checks that equated to nine million dollars, which is what those stock options would have been worth. A couple years later, but I couldn't get to them because they were going to learn that I was an informant before that and be fired. So I basically stole my own golden parachute, wrote five checks for nine million dollars, and I went to prison for that for that fraud. And I had full immunity uh, before that. So then, I mean, what happened after that? I mean, you know, the world just must have been falling apart. How did you guys, you know, deal with this? 
Well, um, he was not dealing with it well. At that point out on the driveway, he kind of threw down a challenge to God. I'm like, you need God in your life. You need to come back to your family. You're just so fractured right now. And he kind of just threw down this challenge. He said, I don't need God. Who needs God? I don't need him. I'm going to be doing all of these wonderful things. That's when I knew he was totally delusional. That, you know, he thought he was going to go back and be the head of the company. And um, so then after that, uh, once it was found out that he was the informant, um, Mark um, attempted suicide. And so that kind of put our whole lives in a, just in a huge spiral. You know, he, he just couldn't uh, handle that he was going to be going to prison. Um, what it was going to, how it was going to impact our marriage, our children, our finances, and everything. So, um, it kind of went down a little, a dark path for a little while for him, especially. But prior to that, the FBI agents, even with the nine million dollar fraud, they knew I made some horrible, under a lot of pressure, some right. horrible decisions under pressure. So they came to us and visited with us, and they went and fought with the U.S. attorney along with my lawyer to get me a six month plea agreement, six yeah. months in prison with a nine million dollar fraud, and because so they're so appreciative. He threw it away. I threw it away. <laughs> threw it in a trash can. Said, I'll never go to prison for six months. And then when she said, sign it, I was so mad at her that she got me. I'd say, you're the one that got me in this mess in the first place. <laughs> the last thing I'm going to do is sign this. And threw it in the trash can and then fought the case through the court system for three years to get a ten and a half year sentence. Instead, and I had a six-month plea agreement right in my hand. Oh, poor Ginger. Yeah. <laughs> she said murder was on the table. Yeah, test your faith. You know, when you're thinking, you're following what, you know, God has told you to do, you know, to, to love him when he's unlovable, to, to go forward with this case, to do whatever you have to do to stop this crime. And, um, and then to see him throw opportunities right. away, you just are like, what are you thinking? And uh, now looking back, it's a whole different view than it was then. Sure. So, you know, what was life like in prison then? Well, for me, shortly before I went to prison, when I had knew I had the six-month plea agreement that I could have had, and I, the fact that I threw that away, now I knew I had to do eight and a half years on a ten and a half year sentence because there's no parole in the federal system. You get 15% off good behavior, so I knew I had to do an eight and a half year sentence. I, I wrote a 17-page letter to Ginger. I wrote letters to all my kids, and I tried to kill myself. I couldn't imagine. I wouldn't even want to go to prison for six months. How am I going to do eight and a half years? And a guy read about that in the, in the newspaper. His name was Ian Howes, and he was CFO of a pharmaceutical company, and he reached out to us. And it was seven months before I went to prison. It was a month after I tried to take my own life, and he, he introduced me to Jesus. Mm -hmm. He started going through Bible study and a study called Operation Timothy, which is introduction to, introduction to the Bible. And, and he introduced me to Jesus, and I, for the first time I had in a long time, uh, I started having some hope. All right. Well, um, in just a minute, we're going to talk about you know, how hope really, um, and, and that the grace of God really mm -hmm. came into your life Absolutely. in just a moment. After earning seven figures for seven and a half, almost eight years, and then in prison, $20 a month <laughs> for nine years in a 10 by 10 and a concrete floor, I, I tell you that I became a free man in prison. The mission of Dominion Broadcasting WLMB-TV 40 is to provide Christ-centered television of high technical quality and programming excellence to uplift, unite, educate, challenge, and encourage viewers in a manner consistent with the teachings of God's Word. Won't you join us? Please send your gift today and be a part of the ongoing mission of WLMB-TV 40. Thank you. Now, back to Main Street. Well, today we're talking about redemption and second chances. And we have been talking about a great story. Mark and Ginger Whitaker sharing their hearts and how um, they discovered the grace of God. And Mark, you were just talking about, you know, you were in prison for eight and a half, nine years, and that is where God radically changed your life. Yeah. As I mentioned, someone reached out to me before I went to prison and introduced me to Jesus. My science background was getting in my way. And my second week in prison, Chuck Colson uh, reached out to me. He went to prison in the 70s for, mm -hmm. for Watergate. He was President Nixon's special White House counsel. He had an office right next to the Oval Office. He's reading about me in the Washington Post about the case. And he reached out to me. And, and when he started sharing the same things that Ian Howes, who first reached out to me, I said, Chuck, but 
I learned it all through college that God doesn't exist, that evolution and, you know, being a Ph.D. scientist from Cornell, I learned God didn't exist. Darwinism and evolution. He said, you don't think scientists believe in God? I said, I'm not so sure any Ph.D. scientist believes in God. And he sent me article after article and book after book, some of the top scientists in the world believing in God. And that had a tremendous impact as I was going through Bible study with him and also Ian Howes. And my third month in prison, in a 10 by 10 and a concrete floor and a locker and a roommate, I surrendered my life to Jesus for the first time in my life, even though I had went to church most of my life. But now you've really grasped the grace of God. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, you're in jail and you're, um, you know, discovering the grace of God. But Ginger, you're, you're not in jail. <laughs> you've got a life going on with three kids. What was life for you like? It was um, different. It was a whole, it was like having your life turned upside down. I went back to school at the age of 40 to finish my college degree, uh, became a teacher, and uh, it, that was just a huge change, being in your 40s, being a first-year teacher, and but God was great. I mean, every place that he was moved to, um, God opened up a school for me. I would go with no job, and God would open up a place um, and surround me with amazing, uh, you know, Christian women to work with who didn't know my story, but were just loving and kind and when I would get moved to another state then another job would open up so uh, it, at times it was very difficult we had a daughter in college a, da a son that had just finished high school and then our youngest was in middle school so it was really the most difficult for him um, basically and I guess I can share like when Mark went undercover our youngest was six years old he was 12 when Mark went to prison and he was 21 when Mark got out of prison so his entire life all was those a, teenage yes, years was in you know, uh, it covered in a prison visiting room. So it was very, at times to some people that might seem very harsh, but for our children, they got the most quality time with Mark, uh, 20 hours a weekend visiting him. You know, you're, you must have had people in your life, your family saying, you know, what are you doing? You know, why don't you leave Mark? He's in jail. <laughs> you know, what, what, yeah. what held you two together? Actually, not one person in my family suggested that to me. We've known each other since we were in junior high, uh, went to high school, dated in high school, through college, got married in college. Not one person within my family ever mentioned that. Uh, it was more like, you know, you've known him, this is not something, uh, this is an abnormality. So uh, it was more like, you know, you've had better, now you have worse, and you just stick with each other. And that's what we did. You know, I just felt like it said for better or worse, and you know, that's what we were going to do and we would get through this. You know, I just had great faith. I, I knew that God would not have taken us down this path if he wasn't going to walk with us along this way to protect us. And the divorce rate's 99 percent. The official statistic, 99 percent divorce rate in prison if you serve five years and longer. Mm -hmm. So we had a 99 percent divorce rate and it just shows me that God don't care about statistics. No. Yeah, that's no. right. Well, no. God certainly gave you a good, good woman. <laughs> Thank you. I know you, you must feel, feel very, very blessed. So, um, you know, you've gone to prison then, and you're, you're basically following him um, prison to prison. And um, at what point did you see changes in him? You know, what kind of changes did you see in his life then? Well, I started as soon as he started uh, Operation Timothy with Ian Howes. I mean, definitely. He, it was more the seeking. He was so seeking knowledge because he, he loves to study. So he was at a great stage. And the longer he was in prison, when he, once he gave his uh, life to Christ, huge change just in him physically. You could see the burden lifted off of his shoulders. I mean, he was facing nine more years of prison, but he had this joy in him of, of life. Um, so it was a huge change, huge change. And, and I had been praying for 10 years for somebody to, to come into his life. Uh, I had tried, I tr you know, sometimes it's easier for someone else to lead someone to Christ than their own family member. And so, so through prayer in prison, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> prayer and undercover and lots of other things. But, um, so when this gentleman knocked on our door and, and introduced himself to Mark, I was so grateful. I mean, it was an answered prayer. So while you're in prison, you know, what is your hope for life after prison? Hmm. Well, even in prison, uh, you know, at, after earning seven figures for seven and a half, almost eight years, and then in prison, $20 a month <laughs> for nine years in a 10 by 10 and a concrete floor. I, I tell you that I became a free man in prison. I was able to take what I was learning from Chuck Colson and Ian Howes and use that same Bible study to take guys through that one by one. 
year after year. And I, I couldn't wait to wake up in the morning and see what God had in store. Help guys learn how to read, learn how to write, get their GEDs. In reality, they probably came, be, became the nine most productive years mm -hmm. of my life in prison. So my whole goal was afterwards to keep serving like that and be a servant leader and not a selfish leader. Because in prison for me was the first time I ever helped somebody else besides myself. Mm. Wow. So, you know, were there certain scriptures that carried each of you through this time? Mm, minus John 316. Yeah. Always, always, you know, because being a parent, thinking that someone could sacrifice their son, I, I can't imagine. And, and that his son died for my sins and for Mark's sins. We were piling up a big pile of sins there. And it was really, um, so for me, that is my life first. Uh, mine really became fairly quickly in June of 98 when I surrendered my life to Christ was Colossians 3.23. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart mm -hmm. like you're working for the Lord and not for man. So I said, even though I'm in prison, there's 700 guys that are hopeless and helpless. What better place to plant seeds and, and, and introduce them to Jesus than federal prison? Yeah. That's and, right. You know, um, and then I, I read your book against all odds and um, you know in the book you talk about the prayers that you had um, mm -hmm. while you're in prison um, you know how did God answer your prayers boy I mm -hmm. tell you 99% divorce rate we're married 38 years uh, Ginger and I so with a 99% divorce rate statistic against us in prison uh, we wondered how Ginger would make it financially the companies that were the victims of the price fixing case gave Ginger like a trust fund, a whistleblower reward that helped take care of my family. Mm. While I was at, the people I stole from took care of my family financially. The FBI agents forgave me, became the biggest supporters. They visited me in prison. They called Ginger, make sure she was okay. And even still today, our biggest supporters. And I had a job the day after I got out of prison. Cornell University started lobbying and had a job for me the day I got out after nine years of prison. Well, but the God. greatest blessing is our family. Yes. That our children, that they have gone through all of this, they're all Christ followers, um, they're all healthy and happy, and, uh, and they, they love Mark and I, and, and as if this was just a speed bump, and they're, they're better for it. So that is, that is my greatest blessing, is that they're yeah. all wonderful. We've been truly blessed. Aww. So what is the hope, you know, that you, what do you hope that people will take away from today's show? I would hope mm -hmm. this is that no matter what adversity they get to go through, it's going to be different than what happened in our lives, but no matter what adversity they go through, mm -hmm. God will carry them through it and they can get better. With adversity, you get better or bitter. And with God, you're going to get better. That's and right. God proved it in our lives. We've seen the evidence. And what do you feel is your purpose in life now? Hmm. I think it's to encourage people in their marriage. I'm, I'm hoping that when someone hears all that we've gone through, that they would just think that, you know, just the importance of marriage and to really to be faithful and to, to lean into God and just say, help us in those times. But I'm, I'm really hoping that it comes across that how important marriage is from my point of view. I'm not sure. From uh, for me, God, I believe God wants, he took my life from ashes to beauty. Mm -hmm. And I believe God wants me to be a witness sharing that with mm -hmm. the world. And I share that from outreach to outreach, city to city, showing the evidence that God does exist. That's right. Well, you guys have an incredible story, um, and you've got this book here, um, uh, Mark Whitaker, Against All Odds. And I want to encourage folks out there to go and pick up the book. But how can people, you know, find out more about you guys, your book, maybe have you speak? Where can they, uh, where can they go? We have a website, uh, www.markwhitaker.com. And on that website, it has our testimony and different interviews we've done and documentaries. And, and so it's, it has our contact information, too, on yes. the website. All right. Well, thank you so much for being our guest here. Uh, we so appreciate you sharing your story and encouraging others to know that, you know, God is a God of second chances. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank All you. right. We'll be right back. You know, if your life is a mess, find out how you can clean it up. WLMB's free monthly program guide keeps you informed about your favorite Christ-centered and family-friendly programming found on WLMB. There's something for the whole family to enjoy, from great Bible teachers to classic family favorites. Plus, you'll find family movies, news from a Christian perspective, local shows Main Street and Pastor's Point, excellent don't-miss documentaries, and much more. Enjoy quality Christian television on WLMB TV 40 and sign up for your free monthly program guide today. Now, back to Main Street. 
Maybe your life is heading in the wrong direction and you're living for yourself and the things of this world. Well, Mark and Ginger, they had everything the world could offer. Mark was climbing the corporate ladder. They were living the American dream. But apart from Christ, there was no fulfillment and the temptation for more made life messy, even to the point that Mark tried taking his own life. But you know what? Ginger remained faithful to God, praying for Mark to have a second chance and to experience God's grace. In Romans 5, we read, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. So even now, even if you're deep in sin and you feel so far from God, he died and he gave his life for you. Even when Mark was caught up with greed and deception, as many of us have experienced, you know what? Christ died for him. We don't have to be perfect to come to God. Your life may be a mess right now, but in Romans it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, Mark was in a dark place. He was in prison when he cried out to God. But guess what? God heard his cries and gave him a new life. In 2 Corinthians we read, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. See, it's never too late to turn to Christ. Mark and Ginger testified to that today, and they are praising God for their new life in Christ. And it is their hope and it is my hope today that if you do not know Christ, that you too will cry out to God for a new life in Christ. Well, if you've enjoyed today's show, we'd love to get your feedback. You can go to WLMB.com or visit us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WLMB TV 40. Well, thanks for joining us today and we'll see you next time for another great episode of Main Street. Please feel free to contact the following to learn more about the topics discussed on today's show. WLMB would like to thank all the faithful supporters of WLMB that make this program possible.